Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the 10th Legislative District Town Hall. My name is Jill Boudreau. Some of you may know me as the former mayor of the city of Mount Vernon, and I am honored to moderate tonight's event. We are so lucky to have this time to listen to our representatives and receive information about the 2024 legislative session. The state's 10th Legislative District spans all of Island County and parts of Skagit and Snohomish counties. Each district is represented by a senator and two representatives. Your 10th Legislative District is represented by Senator Ron Mazal and Representatives Dave Paul and Clyde Shavers. These gentlemen were elected to positions of responsibility, and I know from personal experience that they work really hard for our communities. So thank you, Senator and Representatives, for your hard work and for the amazing support of the Mount Vernon Library Commons Project and putting the needs of your community first. Tonight, our representatives will have a chance to give opening remarks, and then I've got seven questions that were pre-submitted, and then if we get a chance with time, we'll have live questions from all of you. So we do want to let you know that Dignity and decorum is really important to all of us so that we can all share information and feel comfortable doing that. So I wanna just reiterate that. So why don't we get to it? We're gonna start with opening remarks uh, for about three minutes. And so Senator Pizzol, would you please go first? Well, thank you, former mayor. <laughs> um, the, I'm State Senator Ron Mazzal. I live on Whidbey Island. We have farmed here since 1910. Um, my wife and I, two of our daughters and their husbands and their daughters are on the farm. Uh, our grandkids make the sixth generation here on the farm. I was appointed in 19, elected in 20. Uh, I serve on the Health and Long-Term Care Committee, the Ag and Natural Resources, Ways and Means, Rules, and I'm vice chair of our caucus. Um, we strive very, and I say we because uh, it is my staff that makes things work in Olympia. Um, we strive to do our best to serve uh, the constituents of our district, um, the responsibilities that were given to us uh, when we were appointed, elected, um, are also very important to us, but we, we strive to answer back emails and phone calls as quickly as possible and to try to come to solutions. Although we are limited, our legislative powers are just that. They are powers that we need all of the legislature to be a legislature to be able to make new laws in that. But we can work through the different agencies in government to try to resolve issues as they pertain to the state of Washington. Um, the, the reality is my background is on the farm, but it's also in boards of directors. Spent 30 years serving on different boards and organizations before I got into the, into the Senate. Um, so it, my background is really about problem solving. And probably I take the most pride in doing just that. Um, taking problems that uh, are faced by constituents and by the state of Washington and seeing that they have a, uh, an outcome that uh, benefits all involved. So I think that's probably enough for now. Thank you, Mayor. All right. Thank you, Senator. Next up, I'm going to invite Representative Dave Paul to give his opening remarks. Well, thank you so much, Mayor. I really appreciate uh, you hosting, uh, moderating tonight. Uh, for folks that don't know me, I'm a state representative, Dave Paul. Uh, my uh, family and I live in Oak Harbor, and I'm an educator by training. I've uh, worked at Skagit Valley College for 16 years and uh, teach American government there when I'm not in the legislature. Uh, my wife and I have four kids. Our oldest three uh, graduated from college in the last couple of years, and our youngest is now a, a first-year student at University of Washington. Uh, you know, I was fortunate enough to uh, be able to run for office six years ago and, and really impressed by our community and, and what matters most to our community. And I heard so much about the importance of housing affordability and mental health and um, helping folks that are suffering from addiction. Um, it, we've really worked hard to try to uh, emphasize those issues and work on those issues while in the legislature. Uh, and, and as an educator, I care a lot about making sure that folks have pathways to great jobs uh, through higher education and through apprenticeship programs. 
uh, and I focused a lot on work so that students can earn college credit while they're still in high school. Um, and then ferries matter a lot to our community, uh, and I asked to be on the Transportation Committee because of that. Um, I'm also now Vice Chair of the Transportation Committee and Vice Chair of the Ferry Caucus so that I could help uh, with that budget writing and focus on, on ferries. Uh, in this past session, I also worked on some healthcare issues, uh, helping to lower the cost of inhalers and EpiPens and, and working on um, some legislation to help folks that, that are towards the end of their life and, and do not want life-saving uh, uh, procedures like CPR. Uh, and happy to chat about that later if we have time. But those are some of the things I worked on this past session, uh, but really honor to serve and, and be able to listen to folks and then try to advocate for that, for those uh, needs in, in Olympia. Awesome. Thank you, Representative Paul. All right, and Representative Shapers, your opening remarks. Great, well, thank you so much. And thank you so much everyone for joining, uh, staying involved, advocating for issues that our communities care about. Uh, so my name is Clyde Shavers, and I serve as the 10th oh, Legislative District Representative, and I'm a veteran and attorney. Uh, so with the end of the first legislative session, I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to serve you. Uh, and so for the two years as your state representative, I worked as hard as possible each and every day uh, to fight for your issues and ensure that your voice is heard. And so for the two years, um, we've passed seven bills that address a wide range of priorities, uh, including veterans assistance, education, healthcare, helping our rural communities, and many more. And we've also fought for and advocated for millions and millions of dollars to come to our district directly to help in community projects that help um, all of us. I also serve as the vice chair of the House Education Committee, and I'm a member of the Innovation, Community, and Economic Development and Veteran Committee as well as the Capital Budget Committee. Uh, so thank you again for being here, for staying involved, for advocating, uh, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. All right, excellent. Well, thank you. So now we'll move into our questions. And for those listening, I know that we're gonna touch on probably most everything you're interested in in the seven questions, but we will, uh, uh, if we have time, do some live ones. Um, also, I know that these three gentlemen work really closely together in, in bipartisan manner. So um, I'm gonna give each of them a chance to answer the question, but um, for our electeds, if you just concur, you're welcome to do that too. So, <laughs> and we could move along. So uh, first up, I think this will start with Representative Paul. Uh, this is the question. What is the state doing to fix the problems with the ferry system, like crew shortages and delays on building new ferries? Uh, that's a great question. Thank you so much, uh, Mayor. So, you know, it's been a really um, challenging five years or so for folks um, that depend on ferries. Uh, and we, we depend on those for the jobs and healthcare and education. Um, when, I, when I first got elected, I apologize, I've said this story a couple times this, this uh, interim already, but when I first got elected, the uh, number one thing I was hearing about was that there weren't enough staff so that the sun deck could be open on the ferries. And those days are long gone, right? We, we don't have enough staff to keep the ferries running. Um, so we've got two problems. We have an aging ferry fleet. Uh, that we have not, uh, we're going to go 10 years without building new ferries uh, for a couple of different reasons. Um, so we've got to get more boats on the water. And two of those ferries, our, our ferries have not been maintained well. Um, two ferries have come out of service uh, since we've been serving in office. Uh, we need to do a better job maintaining ferries. And then like all industries in our country, we've seen a real shortage of workforce. And uh, we used to lay folks off in the uh, fall and winter on uh, hire. Folks would be hired in the summer to do ferry work and then they get laid off if they were uh, didn't, have, didn't have enough seniority. And one of the first things we did was we said, that's got to stop. Um, this is before we actually started having those crew shortages um, lead to cancellations. So we've got a, a number of programs that are getting folks into the ferry system, both in the engine rooms and on the decks and uh, three main recruitment programs. Those are going well and helping to replace folks that have retired out of the system. Uh, the new budget expands a couple of those programs. The one that the 
the acronym is my tags, but it's it's helping to pull people into the ferry system that might not otherwise be thinking about the working of ferries. Um, that starts with 100 applicants a year. You end up with 10 or 12 folks that actually get recruited in the system. That is going very well, and uh, we are doubling that capacity. And uh, the new ferry, uh, the bidding pr process has been very challenging um, with the, the Seattle shipyard not being able to uh, come to terms with the state, with the ferry system. That we're going to do a new, we have a new bidding process this summer. We should have those bids unsealed this summer uh, with uh, new ferries on the water in, in 28. And in the meantime, the governor's budget had originally cut ferry preservation by about $49 million. That would have affected seven vessels over the next year. Um, I did not think that was smart and worked really hard across the aisle and with our center counterparts to restore that funding um, so that we can have those seven vessels get the maintenance they need, the preservation they need to keep them on the water um, until we start seeing those new boats get on the water in 28. Okay. Really frustrating. Folks have a right to be angry, um, but I think we're making good progress to, to get those issues addressed. Okay. Thank you. Representative Shabers, do you have anything to add to this question? I just want to say um, you know, I really appreciate uh, Representative Dave Paul's um, you know, good work, hard work, as he serves as the vice chair of the Transportation Committee. Um, you know, we've been working to also ensure um, you know, hundreds of thousands and millions of dollars come in to um, help streamline the pipeline uh, so more folks can get into actually working on the ferries. Um, you know, uh, personnel is a, a, a priority for us to ensure that not only do we try to um, retain those who are in uh, the ferry system, but also those who are interested. And so as vice chair of the education committee, we're working on programs um, in our apprenticeships, as well as high school programs to try to encourage and excite uh, young people to serve uh, on our ferries. Uh, finally, um, I also co-sponsored two um, really important bills. Um, primary sponsor uh, is Greg, uh, Representative Greg Nance, um, one of our great colleagues as well. Um, one that would create um, a Washington State Ferry Commission, um, as well as one that would create um, the Washington State uh, Ferry Work Group. Uh, and, and these bills would, would direct the Joint Transportation Committee to evaluate um, the, you know, the requirements. What do we need moving forward? I think these bills, both these bills are quite um, critical and vital because um, this is um, actionable, um, important bills that really um, allow us to evaluate the whole ferry system and try to find dedicated sources, not just within our state government or uh, local uh, funds, but also on the federal side. So, um, you know, working with all of our representatives and senators, this is a priority for all of us. Okay. Senator Mazal, ferries. Well, I liken it to a bad movie, not necessarily <laughs> bad actors, but, uh, this is, a, this is a result of negligence on the part of the state of Washington. As uh, Representative Paul mentioned, this is a long-term problem. Uh, we're not going to easily replace those that were, um, that were fired for not uh, taking the vaccination. Those moved on into the marine industry, which has a labor shortage even worse than the rest of Washington state. So... It isn't like we can go find those people again, uh, bringing people up. Second thing is, is that when we look at retirements, especially among captains and first mates over the next few years, it's, it's going to have a dramatic impact on our ability to keep these ferries going. I personally uh, don't know is that there's a great answer to our labor shortage. Um, you know, we, we uh, hire 10 when we need 100 um, I think that the push to bring these hybrid ferries um, onto um, uh, line is short-sighted. I think the cost is going to be exponential from what we think it's going to be. And I think that we should be thinking about putting um, contracts out for some clean diesel Olympic class ferries to, to uh, bolster our fleet because uh, I, I'm just really worried about what the next few years are going to bring when it comes to our ability to provide that service. Okay. 
Um, the next question, we're going to change topics to climate. So here's the question. Many of us are seeing the real impacts of our climate, our changing climate in our district. What did the state do to support reducing greenhouse gases? Uh, for this, we're going to start with Representative Shavers this time. Uh, thank you. So um, our office has really led on environmental protection, ensuring um, you know higher quality of life. Um, this year, I'm proud to have introduced and passed uh, House Bill 1924, which requires uh, the state to um, consider and pursue fusion technology. Uh, and my belief is that fusion, which is the clashing of atoms, is uh, one of the most environmentally friendly sources of clean energy. Uh, not only is it clean zero emission, um, but it will create good paying jobs, uh, lowers energy bills, and supports a path towards energy independence. So I really think it's the, the holy grail of combating greenhouse gases. Um, not only that, um, I co-sponsored um, House Bill 2301, which reduces food waste. And we understand that um, with you know food waste, the methane gases are, are released as well, which you know harm our environment. Uh, and so this program would really prioritize um, with grant funding, how do we mitigate food waste through uh, food donations or animal feed or compost or digestion? So I think it's a really a big leap towards a healthier environment. And finally, um, you know, this, uh, this also relates to, um, you know, trying to combat um, greenhouse gases is also the pursuit of um, a new technology called green hydrogen, which is the pulling of water um, molecules uh, in, in, in a, with um, help from various offices, including our state mates here. Um, you know, we were successful in advocating for a federal green hydrogen hub, which will bring in about a billion dollars, the B, uh, to Washington State. Uh, towards the development and implementation of this clean energy called green hydrogen. So again, you know, my focus when we talk about environmental protection, when we talk about quality of life, is to ensure that not only do we um, protect our environment for our kids and future generations, but how do we bring high paying jobs? How do we bring um, skill sets that we already maintain and skill sets that we can develop in schools? And how do we ensure that those folks who are already in these um, professions or those folks who are in, might not be in this profession, but might be excited towards it, how do we ensure that their job is protected and they can be part of this environmental conversation? Okay, thank you. Senator Mazal, you're up next. Uh, the question again is about climate. What did the state do to support reducing greenhouse gases? Well, I think that there are a number of things, in, in, uh, especially in Ag and Natural Resources, where I serve as a ranking member, uh, one of which was a bill to help small forest landowners um, in, in, in uh, giving them recompense for their uh, streamside, steep, stable slope. Uh, leaving of those timberlands. So the the reality is is that the, it it gives them some sort of income without cutting those trees, whether it's along uh, a, a stream side, uh, like I say, steep, unstable slopes. Um, before they were required to by the state. Now it gives them, oh, it's uh, fifty to seventy percent of the value of the qualifying timber. But there are enough another. Um, uh, the, uh, there are a number of different areas that we can also help landowners in the preservation of that. The, um, another thing was uh, looking at testing of biosolids. Uh, we got a proviso for the testing of biosolids coming out of secondary sewage treatment systems, septic tanks that are then treated to make sure that we aren't uh, applying those that have a, um, a PFOS, PFAS in them are forever chemicals. There's a number of different things that uh, we we did throughout, throughout the year, whether it was through proviso or whether it was through legislation that allows uh, the state of Washington to take a closer and longer look at what the impacts are going to have on the environment um, now, what what things are we doing now that we are going to not to be able to stop and we won't regret going on in the future? Okay. Um, before we go on to Representative Paul, I'm just going to address. You know, I apologize for a, a very offensive comment in the uh, in the comment section. We're going to ask people to have some decorum when we're working to remove that. Um, it's not acceptable um, in this forum to. 
uh, profanity and all of that. We can disagree, but we can do it uh, with dignity. So I'm going to ask Representative Paul if he might go along with this question again. It's about what did the state do to support reducing our greenhouse gases? Yeah, thanks so much for the qu question, Mayor. Mm -hmm. So it's you know clearly um, a huge issue that you know our country and our state um, have got to address. And I'm proud that our state is uh, a national leader in uh, taking actions to help address climate change. So you know. Uh, uh, one of the biggest sources of uh, greenhouse gases is our transportation sector. Um, ferries are actually one of the, the largest within that um, for producing greenhouse gases for a state agency. And, and I'm going to respectfully disagree about the importance of hybrid ferries. I, I think those are going to make a difference and will help uh, save uh, taxpayers dollars on fuel costs. Uh, and I'm excited to see those. I'm excited to see those coming to our to the sound. Um, you know, we the Senator Mizal mentioned uh, uh, forest management, and we had a bill this past session to help um, small landowners, small timber uh, landowners who who really uh, we have some in our district that are remarkably good environmental stewards, help reforest after forest fires because there's not. Uh, uh, any support for that right now. Um, and that bill did not make it through the, the process, but um, there is $10 million in the, in the capital budget to help both Department of Natural Resources and uh, landowners, uh, private landowners reforest after a forest fire. And that's good because that will help uh, reduce the impacts of, of global warming as well. The state's done good work on helping with um, EV infrastructure, and for anybody who drives an electric car, um, there, there are challenges out there. Uh, I one time ran out of juice um, in downtown Seattle, and it's very challenging to find a charger on a parking garage on a Sunday. Um, our, our state's uh, doing good work on that, and, and Mayor, I appreciate your leadership in making sure that the new library commons uh, will have a uh, so many charging stations to help folks on the I-5 corridor. And then Rep. Schaefer has mentioned green hydrogen. That's really exciting. You know, essentially we can create hydrogen with our hydroelectric and um, solar and wind. When those conditions are great, we actually can produce too much energy to put on the grid. Well, we can be producing hydrogen with that energy. And then that acts like a, a bank and allows us then when the sun's not shining or the wind's not blowing or the hydroelectric is not producing as much to actually use that hydrogen to create electricity on those downtimes. It's really exciting technology. Um, and the state was really forward thinking, preparing for the big federal push on this and had the, those matching dollars ready to pull down that billion dollars that, that Clyde mentioned. Um, th that's a lot of different things, but I think those are all trying to help address climate change and, and to continue our work as national leaders in this area. Thank you. Robust answers on that topic. I have to, didn't think about some of the things you brought up. Um, so another question, and again, these are all pre-submitted, property tax. Uh, there's some concerns uh, for seniors. So what did the legislator do to address rising costs in property tax this year? And we're gonna start with Senator Mazzal. Uh, one of the things was that there was a push to, so property taxes are held within a 1% increase every year. There was an ask by certain municipalities to allow them to increase that to 3% a year, depending on their need. Um, our, we were, this is a result of a, an initiative originally, and uh, we felt, our caucus felt that a 3%, uh, even though it was up to the municipalities or local governing authorities was too much considering what taxes have done. So uh, we we were against that from the beginning and we're able to stop that move to uh, increase the uh, property tax lid lift by 1% and um, keeping it from extending to 3%. There were other bills that we had uh, that didn't go through homestead and, and different things, um, but that was probably the biggest 
as far as holding uh, property taxes uh, down. Okay. Representative Paul, your thoughts okay. on this? Yeah, so really a great question because you know, we have heard so much about the importance of uh, affordability and how uh, as we're trying to keep people in their homes, uh, property taxes are one element of that that we've got to address. Uh, so we've had a, a couple of different bills. Uh, two of these were passed uh, actually last session, um, but th that will help with this area. So 1355, it helps allow for, expands the property tax exemptions for seniors and veterans. We, we had another bill, 1265, I think is the number that expanded the, the help for folks that have intellectual or developmental disabilities. Uh, we had a, 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 a bill this year, I think it was 2026, that helped provide some additional help, uh, uh, $600, a month to help uh, folks um, with, with that, that qualify with property taxes as well. Uh, I, I think a you know, really important issue again is we're, we're talking about housing affordability that we're helping to make sure that folks, especially that are most vulnerable in our communities, are able to stay in their homes. The, if we don't do that, uh, the rental prices are so astronomical right now that it, it's just again, critical that folks can stay in their homes and a way for folks to build wealth through um, the equity in their homes. Okay. Representative Shavers, do you have anything to add on this? I do, yes. Yeah. So um, uh, my priority has always been to um, lower costs uh, for everybody, uh, especially those who are struggling, uh, struggling families and individuals uh, with rise in cost of living and inflation. Uh, this will always be my priority. Uh, so as representative paul mentioned um, house bill 1355 last year um, was a critical bill uh, and i worked very closely with the primary sponsor representative sharon wiley um, to really uh, create this bill um, more robust as and make sure that it passed last year and 1355 you know provides um, greater property tax exemptions for our seniors for our veterans and with those with disabilities uh, and my part was to ensure that um, our counties, um, our local jurisdictions um, provided um, information to those who may be eligible. As we all know, if we pass a bill or a program, if no one knows about it, um, you know, what's the benefit? So I worked very closely with Representative Sharon Wiley on that. Very proud of passing that. Uh, this year, um, I also co-sponsored House Bill 2375, uh, which um, expands on this program by allowing a detached accessory dwelling um, unit, so ADU, to qualify for this property tax exemption as well. Uh, so, you know, overall, I want to make sure that um, we get as many people as possible who are struggling in getting their property tax exempted. And I know it's not directly addressed with property taxes, but also co-sponsored House Bill 1985, which increases retirement benefits as well for our teachers and for our public employees. So, all of this is just to say, you know, I'm really focused on lowering costs and helping those who are struggling already. Okay. All right. Uh, we're on to question four. Um, this may not need each of you to answer it, but we'll try it out. This is about daylight savings time. So the question is, why are we still changing our clocks twice a year? Didn't the state pass a bill to stop the time change? Um, in our in our cycle, it's uh, Representative Paul. Uh, so <laughs> do you <laughs> do you get this one? Yeah, so we did indeed pass a bill um, to ditch the switch um, that uh, with Oregon and California, the three states uh, joined together to petition Congress to stay on permanent daylight savings time. I'm, I'm, I'm laughing in part because um, my daughters are harassing me that why haven't we done it? Um, and everybody's feeling the pain from switching to uh, moving up the clocks. Uh, this week. Uh, Congress has not passed that law to allow us to permanently switch. We can't do it on our own. Um, we could switch to permanent standard time, uh, which is a, a conversation that I think is just kind of starting with folks. And I would ask folks to think about that. If uh, we, we could go where we forego daylight savings time and, and stay on standard time year round, uh, which we haven't really been talking about. It's been the other one. 
the other way, talking about going to permanent daylight savings time. Uh, if folks have uh, thoughts and feelings about that, it'd be good to talk to us you know, this summer when we're uh, preparing for the 25 session. Um, and, and maybe that's something that uh, Oregon and California and Washington leaders should, should look at joining forces, but I'd like to get people's feedback on that. I, I think the conversation has been on, on staying on permanent savings time. Uh, what do folks think about going to permanent um, standard time? Okay. Representative Shavers, Shavers, do you have anything on this one? I'll just briefly say, um, you know, with the end of my first term as um, the 10th state legislator, um, I would say that, uh, you know, we make uh, incremental progress on everything and anything uh, here in, in the House and the Senate, I, I think. And um, I think the, the our democracy works because um, good ideas take time and bad ideas um, hopefully die quickly. Uh, and so, um, you know, just like how our seatmate, uh, Representative Dave Paul said, um, I would love to get your um, feedback, your input. Uh, and if there's a good idea, uh, it will take time. But um, with enough advocacy and push from all of us, um, you know, we'll get those uh, ideas and proposals uh, through. Okay. Senator Mazal, anything to add on this? Well, I think this is a good example of just because we want to do it, just because we pass it, just because we make a law doesn't mean that we can do it. Um, the reality is that the feds have a lot of control over us and what transpires, and we haven't been able to get them to move off the dime on that. Uh, whether we go to daylight savings or standard, um, it is going to be a change. My understanding, we did have a bill this year to go to standard, but we do have to get Oregon and California to go along with that as well. Um, it's just not a simple, as simple as just wanting to do it and making it happen. So this is an example of, of bureaucracy, I guess. Okay. We've actually have a few comments about it already about that. So there you go. All right. Um, the next question is about the grid and infrastructure uh, power grid. So the question is this, we have a power grid problem. PSC, which is Puget Sound Energy, is having a hard time supplying power EV, and EVs will take way more power. What are you doing to address that? And we're going to start with Representative Shavers on this one. So this is, a, um, you know, kind of goes in line with our um, previous uh, question about environmental protection as well. You know, I think um, how do we power all the initiatives, all the proposals and bills that um, lend to a cleaner energy, that lend to uh, folks being able to more easily and in a cost effective way um, use clean energy? You know, I believe that this question really taps into a very important aspect to um, what all of us are trying to do is a balance, a balance to pursue clean energy initiatives, to pursue, um, you know, initiatives that will um, combat um, certain certain uh, climate elements that are um, aggressively degrading our communities, but at the same time ensuring that it doesn't harm um, any of us, our low and um, middle income folks who are already struggling to pay for um, rising um, utility costs. Um, you know, that's why I mentioned about our 1924 House bill um, fusion uh, proposal that passed, because if we create a more holistic energy profile, not just relying on solar or wind or hydro, but let's rely on more energy, clean energy technology like um, green hydrogen and fusion. Let's bring in more people and higher paying jobs. Let's ensure that those who are already in certain sectors maintain that high paying job. Um, then we can kind of accelerate um, powering EVs in our grid that's already overburdened. At the same time, there are bills that um, you know I have voted no on that would really take away certain elements in our energy portfolio that I really thought would harm our low and middle income folks. So again, um, I am focused on ensuring that how do we lower your um, utility costs? How do we ensure that you're not overburdened, but at the same time um, pursue those cost-effective um, uh, energy initiatives? Okay. Uh, Senator Mazal, you're next on this rotation. So question is about uh, having a hard time with power supply, um, what, uh, that EVs may take more power. Well, it isn't. I mean, it's EVs, but it's switching over to heat pumps. It's, it's um, we are going to require so much electricity that we currently don't have 
and don't have the transmission ability for. Uh, the um, Even the hybrid ferries, we can't power them on South Whidbey. It's all going to be have to done on the, on the Muckleteo side because we don't have the grid to supply that kind of power to the extreme end of South Whidbey. I talked to a former ferry employee and they started off with being able to charge them on each side, but it's just not feasible with the current infrastructure. The, the truth of the matter is, I think we're getting a little over our skis on this. Um, I, I think that the future is electricity. I mean, for gosh sakes, we are gonna run out of petroleum long-term. We are gonna have to figure out other ways to power our economy. But at this point in time, uh, it's really hard to see how we are going to accomplish in the next six years what our state government has set up. I mean, to have fully uh, only be able to sell EVs by 2030, um, it is it's hard to imagine how we're going to come up with that kind of electricity, especially if our federal government says we're going to take out things like Snake River dams and, and that kind of a thing. There just is not enough uh, capacity nor transmission ability to be able to do that. And uh, I voted no on the PSE bill. I felt that it gave them a, an unfair advantage, but it also was going to begin to phase out natural gas. And in some places, and you take Whidbey as, uh, for instance, we lose power regularly here. So the truth of the matter is, in many cases, it's only the natural gas that people can keep their homes warm with. So uh, I think we need to take a really good, hard look at the direction we're going and figure out whether it's feasible or not. Yes, our ability long term with nuclear is bright, but we are not there yet. And we, we have to uh, realize that and come to terms with the fact we can't have everything we want now. We we have to we have to do it in slow, methodical steps. Okay, Representative Paul. Uh, thank you for the question. So great, another great question from from folks. So there, are, you know, a number of steps that the state is already taking to help modernize the grid, and, and that's a national infrastructure problem that we've got to address. That we need to modernize our grid, and. Uh, but there are a, a lot of tools and elements that I think uh, help help with that. So, you know, as folks transition to to EVs, much of that charging is done at night when there's actually less demand on the grid. Um, there are uh, ways of of helping that fleets actually can help uh, uh, fleets of cars that are being charged can actually help stabilize the grid. Uh, Senator mentioned heat pumps, they're much more energy efficient. Uh, and as we have rising temperatures and mo more people switching to or needing air conditioning, um, heat pumps save you money in the winter um, and provide an efficient way of having air conditioning in the summer. Uh, I, I think you know, Clyde mentioned, Representative Shavers mentioned green hydrogen. There, there are just a number of elements that we're taking to help make sure that the power is, is there. Uh, still much work to do, but I even, you know, I, I, I will get questions about, uh, we use PSE and, and we'll get those alerts that say that they'll ask folks to reduce their power usage on a, on a day where they're expecting peak energy. Th those alerts are working and helping to change people's behavior. And it's, that that's, that's a good thing that folks are responding and we're just gonna to have to create a grid that allows for that to happen and for folks to be able to uh, recognize that their individual decisions can have a, an impact on the overall community. Um, I, I think these are all good steps and it's something we've got to pay a lot of attention to, but I think we're, we're taking the right direction to help address climate change and, and get ourselves into a, a using cleaner energy. Okay, so we're over halfway there. We've got a couple more questions um, that were pre-submitted and then we'll go to those that uh, may have put something in the chat. Um, continuing along line of energy, this is about natural gas. 
Uh, the question is, can you explain your vote on House Bill 1589? Um, what I thought I'd throw out in there is this is what the bill language says that 1589 was about. It says it's an act supporting Washington's clean energy economy and transitioning to a clean, affordable and reliable energy future. But if you all could help understand what House Bill 1589 was and then answer would be great. Um, so Senator Mazzal, would you start on this one, please? I mentioned this earlier. Uh, the PSE bill is what uh, the, the, was labeled at this uh, 1589. Um, so this was a bill which the lieutenant governor referred to as the hot mess um, because it was poorly crafted. Um, this is going to allow PSE. And as I said on my speech on the floor of the Senate, I don't have anything against PSE. I just have problems with this legislation. Um, this was uh, initially it took out the obligation to serve and we were able to remove that so that uh, PSE couldn't cut off the gas customers. But what this provides is an off ramp for PSE to move, Puget Sound Energy, to move to uh, more of an electrical um, service. They supply both electricity and gas. They make more money on a kilowatt hour than they do on a cubic foot of, of natural gas. Um, but if indeed the future is uh, electricity and away from fossil fuels, they realize that they've got to replace um, fossil fuels, uh, not only in what they offer to the consumer, but how they generate electricity. Currently, 56% of the electricity that Puget Sound Energy generates is by coal and natural gas. They have nine gas to electricity plants in Western Washington, one of those in the 10th district. Um, they're using natural gas to generate electricity, which then they provide to the grid. Um, that they, they're only about 32% hydro. Now they do purchase outside energy from BPA, but they're, they're producing a tremendous amount of the electricity, which they're supplying to us customers uh, with coal, 36%, 20% natural gas. To replace that, uh, we live in an era where dams aren't possible. So they need to switch over to a non carbon-based electricity generating uh, uh, capability. And that's probably going to be nuclear and it's probably going to be expensive. I mean, long term, uh, we know that these small nuclear plants, which they can place uh, strategically without having to increase transmission lines, are going to be expensive. This would allow them to do that. I think it's unfair for the state of Washington to provide what I explained in on my floor speech as a corporate welfare to one utility com company to to make this switch over, and it's going to cost going to cost those of us who live in Puget Sound Energy territory more money um, in order for them to be able to invest to to remove that. Uh, I think that there are ways of doing this. I think that there are ways of doing this more equitably, and. Uh, uh, and I voted no on the bill. Uh, unfortunately, it ended up passing uh, by a pretty narrow margin in the, in the House. Okay. Representative Paul, then from the House version. Yeah. So, so a, a really complicated um, issue. Uh, I'll try to explain it as best I can as well. Um, so you know, right now we've got uh, PSC is providing gas and natural gas and electric uh, to many of its customers. Um, and as you see folks leave natural gas, which is happening, and you see more um, new home sales where they are not hooking into natural gas. So the, the um, housing development, I know of, they're using heat pumps and not natural gas. Uh, you, you get fewer and fewer people that um, have to use natural gas, they're going to pay for the infrastructure. So as folks transition away, from, if they, they shut off the gas for their house, that puts, in order to save them money, that means that the lower income folks that can't afford to do that, can't afford a heat pump, um, are going to pay more and more 
of the price for that natural gas infrastructure. I hope that makes sense. Um, and so as you see that happening right now, PSE has no tools to help those low income folks that are going to be the last ones using natural gas. Uh, they're going to have to pay for if the bill had not passed 100% of that natural gas infrastructure. So this provides PSC with some um, additional tools to help uh, smooth out that transition, uh, especially for the low-income folks that are going to have the hardest time, seniors and others that aren't going to be able to afford to switch right away. Um, it, a complicated bill. Um, I wish the bill had not been made so complicated, uh, but that is why I voted for it. And in the end, I, I felt like this was needed for those folks that aren't going to be able to switch to expensive heat pumps right away. Okay. Representative Shavers, this is the same question. Great. Thank you. Um, so like uh, both my seatmates said, uh, this is a definitely complicated bill, um, complex bill. Uh, so I voted no um, on this bill. Um, you know, I'm uh, referring back to my previous comment, um, you know, I'm focused on balancing the needs um, towards environmental initiatives, but also ensuring that um, we don't see rate increases. Uh, we try to lower utility costs as much as possible. Um, you know, my I'm, I'm very resistant um, um, with this bill due to the fact of potential rate increases that will impact uh, potentially low and middle income folks. Uh, concern with this bill uh, that it might have an adverse impact um, for consumers. And so while I support um, decarbonization efforts uh, and environmental efforts, um, you know, I, I want to make sure I'm committed to um, ensuring um, equitable and cost effective ways that don't hurt any of us. Uh, so um, again, this bill is very complicated, very complex, um, um, but uh, I'll continue to think carefully on um, the costs associated with um, the environmental bills that we continue to push forward. And so it was hard for me to support this bill. Okay, thank you for your answers on that. All right, um, the last question before we go to some of our live questions is about cost of living. We're gonna start with Representative Paul. The question is what with food prices going through the roof, what has the legislator, legislature done to address the rising cost of living for Washingtonians? Representative yeah, Paul. Great question. So, uh, you know, I had a, a bill to help lower the cost of um, asthma medication and EpiPens. That's life-saving medications for folks that have asthma and, and EpiPens for folks that have uh, food allergies or, or allergic to bee stings. Um, and the, last year, the legislature capped the cost of insulin at $35. And so this year, came in, coming in the legislature, in a legislative session, I, I, I asked, why can't we do this with um, inhalers and EpiPens? And really proud that that bill passed in unanimously in both chambers. Uh, yeah, I focus a lot on education. So thinking about ways of helping to lower the cost uh, of education and some of the work on dual credit to allow students to earn um, credit while they're still in high school, uh, either for free or uh, with college and high school or great tuition free for running start. Uh, we had a, a also uh, uh, bills to help with expand the Washington College grant uh, to better align that with the federal Pell grant that's going to help save uh, Washington families um, a lot of money as they're helping to get, make sure that their kids have pathways to family wage jobs. We've just taken a number of different initiatives um, to try to help rein in costs and, and provide some relief to Washington families. Okay. Representative Shaver, same question. So this is a very important question as well, um, along with all the other important questions that we addressed. Um, but like I said, um, you know, I, my priority is and will always be to um, lowering costs as um, cost of living, uh, including groceries and gas and housing continues to rise along with inflation. Uh, so, you know, touching upon so many different things that our office has done, you know, Previously, I mentioned that working with Representative Sharon Wiley on House Bill 1355 for the property tax exemption expansion, along with co-sponsoring bills along with that, um, uh, co-sponsoring bills that um, increases retirement benefits for teachers, 
um, and our public employees. Uh, last year, I'm very proud to have introduced and passed um, a bill related to food banks to allow food banks to more easily use state funds for um, essential non-food items. So food banks can more easily carry diapers and um, hygiene products, for example, because as we know, our community needs more than just food, but other essential items as well. You know, on the education side, since I'm vice chair of education, we're looking at um, early learning. How do we ensure that um, our uh, kids have access to uh, TK, transition to kindergarten programs or ECAP? Um, and along with that, how do we ensure that um, our families have access to affordable childcare. Uh, so we're really focusing on that as well. And finally, like I said, there's so many issues. I would it would take eight hours um, talking about what we're doing. But um, you know, affordable housing is a, a critical component to um, our seniors, our low uh, middle income folks, our veterans, uh, and our, also our young adults as well. So. Um, you know, we've been really focusing on advocating for millions of dollars to come in for affordable housing projects like workforce housing in Coopville um, last year um, that we got. We also have affordable housing money for a project in Langley. And finally, it's important to also focus on veterans, um, veterans um, um, who are active duty, reservists, National Guard. Um, it, it, uh, this year, we pushed a bill that would create a statewide veteran service officer program. VSOs are critical to ensuring that our veterans have access to the benefits that they deserve. Unfortunately, um, it didn't make it through the whole process, but we're working very closely with um, veteran legislative coalitions, for example, and other local um, chapters and veteran service organizations to ensure that every veteran across every zip code, across every corner of the state, have the benefits that they deserve, including medical, housing, utilities, um, retirement, and disability. Great, thank you. All right, Senator Mazal, do you want to wrap us up on this question? Well, this is uh, a frustration for me. Almost everything we do when it comes to housing, when it comes to education, when it comes to uh, natural resources and agriculture ends up costing the consumer more money. Uh, when we look at the cost of a home, how much of that is involved in permitting and in state regulations? When we look at food, uh, once again, we continue to drive up the, the costs uh, of food. For instance, our Carbon Commitment Act, um, we're just shy of 50 cents, but it takes fuel to raise the food. It takes fuel to transport it to processing, transport it to wholesale eventually to your grocery store, every step, that 50 cents a gallon is adding to the cost of food. Washington State has the fourth highest food costs in the nation. Seattle is number one of cities of its size when it comes to the cost of food. Across the board, we continue to, to just, this is death by a thousand cuts, this cost of living that we're seeing in this state. And all of the legislation that we talk about has some sort of an impact on that cost of living. We hear about taxes, that's a portion of it. But it just goes on and on. Car insurance, a lot of that is due to the fact that cars, we have one of the highest um, theft rates of vehicles in the United States. All of these things uh, contribute to our cost of living. And uh, even though we think we're, we're doing well, in every exemption we give for property taxes is just a cost shift. It goes to those who aren't getting exempted. So uh, we need to take a really hard look at what we do in Olympia and all of these feel-good bills that we pass that are really and truthfully adding to our cost of living here in the state of Washington. Okay. So that is uh, all the pre-submitted questions. Uh, we've got time for one question. Um, and this is going to come from Jacob Bruns. Jacob Bruns, hope I said asked, uh, said your name right. I think this is a great one. It's can we stop companies from purchasing single family homes and renting them out? Kind of has to do with housing. So we're going to start with uh, Representative Shavers on this one. So um, uh, thank you very much, Jacob, for this question. And, um, you know, as we see uh, here locally across the state in the nation, we continue to see, um, you know, hedge funds, um, uh, potentially other um, corporations, uh, both domestic and foreign, um, buying property. 
Um, and so um, we've been trying to tackle this issue, um, our office actually directly, because it really um, affects the affordability of where we live in the most one of the most direct ways. Um, I believe that as your state representative, um, you know, my focus is to um, protect your family, to ensure that your family um, has the wages, the benefits, um, so you can support your family. But along with that, to ensure that you can actually afford a home here, whether you want to um, buy a home or rent a home. So um, last year, we took, we took a stab at it, um, first looking at the agriculture or the farmland side. So we introduced a bill that would prohibit the purchase of agricultural land, farmland, um, by foreign corporations, foreign entities, and foreign governments. Um, the bill didn't pass. We're still looking to improve upon it. But that is kind of one step towards trying to figure out how do we ensure that um, our folks can be the ones um, purchasing the homes and you know benefiting from our own community. So um, it's a complicated issue, uh, and we are slowly trying to tackle this in the most collaborative um, way possible. Okay. Senator Mazzal, same same question. Your thoughts on this? Well, then I guess it should be separated. Are we talking long-term rentals or are we talking short-term rentals? Those are really kind of two separate issues. Um, the reality is, is that um, uh, there we've got a tremendous amount of short-term rentals on Whidbey Island. And uh, those are typically owned by privates. They're not owned by big companies. Um, there are in the Seattle Metroplex, my understanding is there are some big organizations that have come in and have bought up single family homes for rentals. But the reality still comes down to the same thing, and it's supply and demand. If we had more homes, then the, the, uh, uh, we would have less demand, more supply, less demand, the cost for rentals would be down. It's pretty simple. We simply have to um, build more homes in the state of Washington in order to uh, take care of the demand. Uh, there are some municipalities who have outlawed short-term rentals. I, uh, I know particular cities in eastern Washington that have done that. But the reality is, is that uh, that's uh, formed some sort of backlash as well. But uh, it's pretty tough to create. I mean, I guess you could create a taxing scheme that if you own more than one home, then the second one would be taxed at a higher rate. Um, although that probably would be uh, outlawed by the uniformity clause in our constitution. So um, it's a it's an interesting uh, idea. I'm not sure how constitutionally you could accomplish that. Okay. And then Rep. Paul, last word on this question. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so I, I know a couple of states are looking into this, and I think they're uh, specifically targeting the hedge firms um, that are uh, do, doing this as an investment strategy. And I'm not sure if those states have passed that those laws or not yet. Um, I think Minnesota and New York and maybe another one have have started that process. This is a great question ahead of, um, you know, the, we just left the 60 day session. Um, uh, this would be a big bill that we'd have to address in the 105 day session for next year. And to find out some of those questions about where the, yeah, how are the, how are the states proposing to do that? And is that constitutional? It certainly, um, you know, it affects the ability for, you know, home buyers or, or folks that are trying to buy their first home if that housing stock is not available um, to be able to, to, to be able to have enough housing stock so they can actually make that first purchase. I'd want to do more homework on this before I, I commit to about if we can pull it off. Okay. So um, we're actually going to run up against time. And I know we've got oh, 200 and over 200. You have questions that didn't have a chance to get answered. Um, a few of you have made those comments. So what I'm going to ask you to do now is when we're finishing up, um, go online. You're online now. Um, you could Google the offices of our representatives. You can email them. Uh, you can sign up for their newsletters. You know, I, I know that they're responsive. And so, 
you know, send your questions directly and ask for response. So don't forget to do that and, and not think that, you know, we didn't care about all the questions. There's just limits of time. So, okay. So now we're going to, we're, we are going to wrap it up. We're going to have closing remarks. Um, again, thank you all for joining us tonight. So I'm going to ask uh, to start with Representative Shavers, uh, just uh, closing thoughts and remarks um, as we end our evening. So again, I want to say thank you so much. Um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to serve you, to fight for you and make sure your voice is heard here in Olympia and across the state. Um, you know, as we all experience in a time of uh, political hostility and divisiveness, I've tried my hardest to take the punches, take the meanness and turn around um, with kindness and caring. And um, after, the, um, after collecting and reflecting on so many of your stories and our struggles these past two years, you know, I've learned, I'm recognized that I'm very hopeful about our future. You know, I believe that our country is great because of you, your resilience, your endurance to grow together, your compassion towards helping those who you may never meet, uh, and your true belief in our democracy. You know, I gotta say, serving in the, in, the, in the legislature has been one of the most challenging endeavors I've ever experienced, uh, but it's also one of the most meaningful um, endeavors. So I'm so honored to serve you and so honored to have gone on this adventure with you. So thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Representative Paul, closing closing remarks. Thank you so much. So I'd like to thank our staff. It's a long day. They worked on, um, um, some of them are probably on their 12th hour um, and, and for uh, putting this on. And uh, during session, um, I don't know what the totals are for this past session, but last year we were getting about 400 emails a day. Um, you can imagine that over the 100 days. Uh, really appreciate all the work of all of our LAs and the staff behind the scenes. Uh, and Mayor, thank you for uh, moderating tonight. Um, as always, an amazing job. Um, and I'd like to thank everybody who's uh, attended tonight and the, the questions you submitted ahead of time. Uh, that allowed us to you know, kind of look for the questions that were reoccurring, that people had multiple multiple people had requested, put in those questions. The really thoughtful questions in the group and appreciate your engagement. Um, and, and thanks to our seatmates. We, uh, there are folks who do not necessarily get along with their seatmates. I think we're blessed that we uh, all uh, can treat each other with respect and, and enjoy working together. And, um, you know, we don't always agree, uh, but we, this is a really, um, this is a swing district and uh, uh, not everybody's gonna agree with each other. Uh, and we don't always agree in Olympia, but uh, really appreciate the opportunity to work with both of you. Thank you. Senator Bazal. Well, thank you, Mayor, for serving again tonight uh, in our forum. Uh, thank you, Dave and Clyde, for the participation We've got real problems facing us in the state of Washington, and some of them don't come with simple, easy answers. Some of them are very challenging. Some of them uh, are a bit partisan, uh, and it's our job to come up with solutions that serve the greatest numbers of our constituents. Um, we try to do that. Our staff tries to do that. We each try to do that. We're not always going to agree all the time, and I think that that's normal. That, that is not something that's abnormal. Being kind, considerate of one another should be normal. We shouldn't have the kinds of uh, comments that we saw on our feed there tonight. Um, if we're going to survive as a, as a country, as a society, we've got to come together to solve issues and not drive things apart. And uh, that is where our future lies. And for my kids and my grandkids, um, I'm hopeful for that. I, I'm, I'm hopeful that our extremes are just that, extremes that are getting smaller all the time. So thank you for all who attended. Um, thank you for the questions and have a good evening and enjoy the spring weather when we get it. All right. Thank you again to our uh, 10th Legislative District elected officials for your work. And on behalf of everyone, again, good night. Good night.